night she wears her worries like a wound She troubles every day Never learns to leave it alone And every gas she opens lets her bleed once again Oh, honey happy just wants to come back home Oh, happy just wants to come back home and she gathers tears from strangers and collects them in her heart Imagining that their pain is her own And she'll stand with them in battle Without a shield or sword Oh honey happy just wants to come back home Oh happy just wants to come back home and you'll say your song. your song, it's gotta be our song, our song. we gotta be singing, singing. that heard out loud. Oh, you say your song, your song. it's gotta be our song. our song, we gotta be singing, that heard out loud. And she walks the beaches daily waiting for the tide to turn. Launching her bottles in the foam And she's longing for some answers from that mystical beyond Cause honey happy just wants to come back home Oh happy just wants to come back home And you say your song It's gotta be our song We got be singing that hope out loud oh you say your song it's gotta be our song we gotta be singing that hope out loud Just wants to come back home Oh, happy just wants to come back home Cut! Oh, that felt good. How did it look? Great. And was it clear that now we're at 8 p.m.? Not 7 p.m., but 8 p.m. on June 10th? June 10th, 8 p.m., Crystal Clear. And no longer the battle of the improv maniacs. Now it's last maniac standing. Yep, last maniac standing. Got it. <sighs> and, we'll, and we're not doing team challenges anymore. This will be an individual challenge. Individual, yep, live on Facebook. And I'll be hosting. I'm so excited. Good evening, virtual land and friends of Grand Prairie Live Theatre, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Desiree Klaus, and I'll be your host for this evening's Story Circle. Story Circle is going to be a bit formatted a bit different than Story Slam, meaning that there's no more harsh time limits, no more losers or winners, just sharing of our creations with each other live on Facebook and YouTube for everyone to enjoy. So tonight's topic is change. And we have five storytellers from across the province ready to share their stories with each other and anyone that is joining in us virtual land tonight. So our storytellers for tonight are Alyssa Hudson, Megan Mulligan, Judy Salido, Elizabeth Swanson, and Moira Penn. So how it's going to work tonight is I am going to draw from our fancy hat here and whoever name I pull first will be our first storyteller for the evening. So here we go, let's just jump right into it. Moira, you're up, Moira. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good, how are you? Awesome, are you ready? 
I think so. I, I have well, it. it's in a Word document, so I'm gonna have to read it. So, all no right, problem. we're all looking forward to it. So, whenever you're ready, all right. From as early as I can recall, the world has told me to change change my size, change my shape, change my hair, change my face. I've been told to change my laugh, change the volume of my voice, change my tone, change my attitude. There have been times I've been told to change my style, change my taste in music, change my taste in books, change my taste in friends. Then there were times I was told to change my religion, change my spirituality, change my sexuality, change my intensity when I'm talking to someone. More recently, I was told to change my pain tolerance, change my mental health, change my distrust of men in the arts industry after being sexually assaulted by someone I worked with. I was told to change my resume, change my career goals, change my plans for the future. I remember the time I was told to change my political stance, change my dedication to supporting marginalized communities, and change my love of all things LGBTQ2SIA+. In a parking lot one time, I was told to change the bumper sticker on the back of my truck. Born again pagan didn't sit well with the conservative views of the woman who happened to be driving behind me. Apparently the irony was lost on her. In high school, I was told to change my views on being pro-choice and the right to have an abortion. In my early twenties, I was told to change my eating habits, change my exercise regimen and change my breast size to better suit a man I was dating. He sure wasn't going to change his demands on my existence. As a new mother, I was told to change how I fed my babies. After days of unsuccessfully trying to breastfeed, I opted to go with bottle feeding rather than unintentionally starve my kids. A doctor offered to change the shape of the part of my body through which I had given birth twice, suggesting my husband would probably enjoy it more. As my daughter and son grew, I was told to change my menu options, change my language, change my belief system, all to appeal to those who knew better than I did. I've been told to change the amount of coffee I drink in a day, change the medications I take, and change my face from a frown to a smile, because happiness is a frame of mind, even if your brain doesn't actually generate the necessary chemicals to create it. Now change the mental illness holy trinity I've been gifted. Change my depression, my anxiety, my PTSD, because they scare people. Be a magician and change them into happy little trees, because you're more palatable to the world when you're a happy little tree. I've been told to change my sense of humor, change how I write creatively, and change how I present my work to the world. Someone once demanded that I change my side in a battle. As I age, society has demanded that I change my hair color, change the bags under my eyes, and change the texture of my skin. Wrinkles tell stories, but we're not meant to share those with the world, I guess. I've long understood that sometimes all we need is a change of scenery. However, that would mean that I change my financial status overnight, which means I have to change the pace at which I'm willing and able to work to achieve independent wealth, change my timeline. I've been told to change my level of tolerance for people deemed different by society. Don't give change to the homeless woman outside the grocery store. Don't provide a safe space for people impacted by poverty and addiction to have a quiet cup of coffee and a sandwich, and certainly don't offer my home as a sanctuary for those in crisis and in need. Don't change the boundaries between haves and have nots. Now change those boundaries to create a bigger gap. Change the causes I support, the marches I attend, the organizations I donate to. Change my status on Facebook, change my face and my profile picture to appear slimmer, change the nature of the posts I choose to engage with and share. Change how big I love, change how much energy I invest someone, in someone, change my relationships to better suit the narrative people have created for me, about me. I'm sick and tired of being asked to change. The most radical thing I've recently learned to do is to love myself for who and what I am in this moment. I don't need to change in order to fit into a societally established box of woman, daughter, sister, mother, partner, friend. I don't need to change my gray hair, stop being tattooed and pierced, or stop standing up for what and who I believe in. When change occurs naturally, organically, I embrace that it is a change that is meant to be meant for me. But when I am being forced to change, I will turn inward and warm myself by the fire I have stoked deep within. I lovingly call it my sacred rage. And it is by this light that I sit and craft my story, that I etched into existence the path on which I continue to travel. While I do not fear change, I do not fear the consequences of refusing to change just to make the, the world more comfortable to be around me. I unapologetically take up the space that I need, the space in which I call myself creatrix, witch, warrioress, feminist, student, woman. I will not change to suit your palate. Do not change to better suit mine. Somewhere in the middle, we will meet and share our journeys. The end.
That was fantastic. Thank you. It was way longer than I meant it to be. I'm sorry. <laughs> I really like that sacred rage and yes. how you interpreted the theme and all the social issues that you brought up to it. It's right? super realistic and relatable as a woman. Yeah. Especially I think we need to have like sacred rage circle. Yeah. Right. Like we should have a sacred rage circle and we should work on it and we should use it and but yeah. That's it. We're inventing it. A sacred rage Fantastic. circle. I love it. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Moira. Thank you so much. Before we move on to our next storyteller, I just want to remind you that next Thursday at 10 or at 8 p.m. on June 10th, you saw the little video for it before we started. We have our last maniac standing. So the contestants will be playing solo improv games for the title of champion. So you can enter by emailing the box office at box.office at gplt.ab.ca. So we hope to see you out either as an audience member or participant. That would be fantastic. Okay, let's get to our next storyteller. Megan Mulligan, you're up. Well, ready? that's something to follow. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was Great epic. job, Maura. It was so good. Just uh, use so your take rage. <laughs> <laughs> you, you might hear it. It's a little bit different, but it <laughs> it's in there. Awesome. So I'm also reading from a document, so bear with me. Um, it has been a year of change. And as an educator, I've seen a lot of change go through the classroom. More importantly, the 23 little people I take care of and strive to teach each day have been battling through all these changes. Some take it well, and some I keep pulling up by their toenails as they start to slither through the cracks. They're slippery little things. A few weeks ago, we had to pivot to online learning again, go back and be the basement dwelling trolls that we are isolated from the world. But maybe that's just a personal reflection. My class had to pack up all their stuff, take it home, and wonder if they were going to be able to see each other again in person before the end of the year. They were doing great. Well, most of them were doing great. And then there was this little gem who I'll call Polly. Polly is one of those sweet kids you want to fold up and put in your pocket to keep her safe. She is also one of the most frustrating little balls of confusion that you want to throw across the field, hoping she'll find somewhere nice to live far far away from you. It's a complicated thing. I call her my vacant sweetheart. She might have a tough day, but at the end of it, she storms out of the classroom yelling, have a great day, Miss M. Even those days when I feel like maybe I was too hard on her or the days when she was too hard on me, have a great day, Miss M. <laughs> so here we go, back to our pivot, our transition, our change. The kids brought bags to carry their stuff, big reusable bags to carry big bins of all their supplies. Polly has a particularly large bin, probably twice the size she should have. It takes up all the space under her desk. It's full of things I asked her to take home months ago. It's full of things I asked her to never bring to school. It's full of random treasures, like fidgets, toys, paint, crayons, papers, cut up glue sticks, rainbow loom elastics, and tiny felt markers she made by cannibalizing other felt markers and getting ink everywhere. With that one, I congratulated her on being creative, then told her to take the tiny felts home so I never have to see them again. I'm sure I'll see them tomorrow. For this pivot, she did great. She remembered a giant reusable bag that would fit her whole bin. I'm amazed one existed. Even Ikea would be hard pressed to pr provide in this case. Tiny little Polly pushed her bin and pulled the handles of the bag and grunted and groaned and got everything shoved into place. She even managed to tie the handles. She took whatever she couldn't fit in the bin and shoved it piece by piece into her backpack. Shoes, lunch bag, papers that could have just been recycled. It all went into that backpack. Polly, you can just recycle that, I would say as I walked by. Oh, okay, she would happily explain back. Inevitably, I would then watch her push that paper into another cre crevice in her backpack. But she got it all in. <laughs> she zipped it up. Great job, I told her. The, bang the bell rang and all the kids filed out, trudging under the heavy load of their supplies, hearts heavy as well, as we wondered if they'd get to come back and be with their friends at the end of this trying year. They all huffed in annoyance when I made them put their stuff down to get their hands sanitized one more time before they left. Some tried to sneak by. Some declared, 
they'll do it when they get home. But no, we have a routine for safety and I wasn't gonna let up on our pivot day. Off they went, but Polly was still in the class. She struggled to lift her backpack and put it on. I hoped her backpack didn't slide forward and hit her in the head as she leaned forward and picked up her bin, a bin that suddenly seemed even bigger than her. She slammed it down on a desk. I told her I was proud of her for getting all her stuff cleaned up and getting ready for home. And I turned my back to straighten some papers. Then I heard it, a sound that made my eyes widen and my heart drop. Click, click, a snap being fastened together. It couldn't be. I turned around slowly and there was Polly being pulled backward by her backpack, arms wrapped wide around her bin and a helmet on her head. Miss M, how am I gonna ride my bike home? Blink, blink. Um, what are you talking about? You can't ride your bike home. Oh wait, yeah, no, I have to ride my bike home. You have too much stuff, Polly. You can't ride your bike home. What are you talking about? Oh yeah, no, 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 my dad is picking me up. Never mind, I remember, he's picking me up. So you're gonna put your bike in the trunk? Yep, that's what we're doing. I'm so silly, I forgot. Have a great day, Miss M. And off she went. Relieved, I went about cleaning up, walked myself to the library to drop some things off. I was writing a note for the librarian when the door from outside opened. Hi, Miss M, Miss Hudson is helping me, Polly yelled triumphantly. I looked up so confused. The assistant principal gave me a tired look and said, Polly was trying to ride her bike with all her stuff. She was going to cause an accident, so I'm calling home. Polly, you told me your dad was picking you up. Well, he is now, she exclaimed joyfully. Shaking my head, watching her flounce through the library, trailing the principal, helmet secure on her head, I sighed, but at least I knew the office had her. 15 minutes later, I headed back to my classroom and another teacher stopped me in the hall. Hey, did you know Polly was still outside on the tarmac? Earlier, right? I asked. No, now. What is this, a horror movie? I exclaimed. She was just in the office. I saw her in the office. Her dad was picking her up. Everything was planned. She had giant bags and bins and she was getting a ride. Oh, that's not what she told me, the other teacher said with a laugh. She said she had to take all her stuff and ride her bike home. And then she hopped on and sped off. <laughs> oh my God. I hope that was planned. I hope adults were involved in that decision. But since she is gone, I'm going to my classroom. I'm going to sit there in the dark. And if somebody calls me, I will help her then. They didn't call me. She got home safe. So it's been a lot of change. Some make it easy and some make me remember that terrifying click click of a bike helmet being snapped together. A bike helmet that meant everything simple was about to fall apart. The end. Great ending, Megan. <laughs> As a teacher myself, um, I really like how you use the theme of change and relate it you. to the pandemic. I've heard a lot of teachers, myself included, there's lots of stories like this, right? Of mm -hmm. students and how do we internalize that as educators? So I really liked hearing your perspective. Thank so you thank so you. much. Okay. Um, I'll move on here and just uh, say another quick thing. If you're a playwright who has a draft of a play that you'd like read, or maybe you have an idea you've been mulling about, but you don't really know how to put it to paper yet, um, contact us here at GPLT. We're looking for new scripts for our virtual readings during our evenings. So if you have an idea or a script that you've been holding on to, email us here at uh, box.office at gplt.ca. Okay, so we'll move on to our next storyteller. Judy Salido. So Judy, hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm looking forward to your story tonight. <laughs> yes, well, um, me and my friend are here together and uh, we just found out the theme was change. And so we haven't done as good a job at <laughs> of aligning with the theme as the other two stories, which were amazing. Um, this is more a story about how I have no change. <laughs> so uh, here it goes. <laughs> it was one of those days. 
I was driving home from work on a Friday in December, minus 20. It was dark, even though it wasn't late. And I was completely wound up from the stress of work, the busyness, the problems, so much going on. And I was completely lost in thought as I drove the familiar route home along the Yellowhead. The one thing I did remember is that we were having company for dinner, had to stop and buy a bottle of wine, and I desperately needed gas. So I get to the gas station and I was still lost in thought as I got out of the car, swiped my card and started to fill up. And just a couple seconds later, something snapped me back into the moment. Wait a minute. I know I don't have any money in my bank. None. Zero. I'm positive. So who put money in my bank account <laughs> and how did they get it there? Oh, I was so confused. And then it's like, but wait, that's not likely someone could put money in my account. And that means I'm stealing this gas right now. So all of that convoluted thinking took less than a minute, but I panicked and I ripped the gas nozzle out of my car, out of the car to avoid stealing any more gas than was necessary. And, uh, wanted to get out of there as fast as I could, but I forgot to let go of the trigger. So now I was spraying gas all around my car and the pump, and it was going in circles, in uncontrolled circles from the force of the pump. I was so flustered. I just hopped into the car and took off across the parking lot to get the wine. Still wondering who put money in my account and how much was there? So I'm in the liquor store at the till with my <laughs> bottle of wine, which of course I would buy with my credit card, not my bank card this time, but they're the same color. And I mistakenly gave the clerk my debit card. And just then a young woman bolted in the door of the store. My first thought was she was a street person because she wasn't wearing a coat and her hair was stringy and wet from the snow and she looked angry and cold. But she barged in and yelled in a very loud voice, did someone just buy gas at the Husky? Oh, I slowly put up my hand and felt my face flush. Yes, it was me. And she screamed, you didn't pay. Well, the story of what happened, the explanations, the excuses, the confusion, everything, all of it tumbled over inside my mind, one thought over another. And the only thing that came out of my dumbfounded mouth was, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and just then the clerk came back. Your card has been declined. So the guy behind me in the lineup lost it. He started laughing so hard uh, at this scene unfolding before him. And he said, wow, lady, you're on a roll. First, a gas station heist and now a liquor store robbery. You really do need that bottle of wine. Let me buy it for you. And he did. So I left the store and drove back to the Husky to settle up my bill. I had to wait for the poor little girl who was trudging back through the snow without a coat. Thank you so much for sharing that, Judy. I could just visualize the gas flying everywhere. That was a great moment. <laughs> and I like the little redemption moment with the wine at the end. That's cute. He bought you your wine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, so just a reminder that on June 17th, GPLT is going to be hosting Poetry Cafe live on Facebook and YouTube, so you can share your poem with other poets and virtual friends online. And June 24th is our Singer and Songwriter Showcase, so we're looking for original songs written to the theme of emergence. Uh, there's 10 spots available. So recorded songs can be sent to the box office. And again, box.office at gplt.ca. So we'll move on to our second to last storyteller. We have 
Alyssa, it's your turn. Hey. Hey, how are you tonight? Good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm really Good. enjoying the stories so far. Me too. Great stories. Yes. So are you ready? I'd love to I hear what so. you came up with. Okay. The summer before grade four, I went to visit my aunt and uncle in Vancouver. During my visit, they took me to a very upscale hair boutique and I got my hair cut into a very chic, stylish, short bob. I loved it. All summer, I felt sophisticated and tall. When summer was over and I returned to school, I was the talk of the halls. In 1988, little girls did not typically wear their hair short and I was the first in my school, I think. It's very possible I wasn't, but it really felt like I was. Before long, I needed a trim, and my mom brought me to the salon where we always got our haircuts. Unfortunately, the stylists in that particular strip mall had not yet had much practice on chic, stylish, short bobs. So instead, I got one of the short do's they knew how to do, which, as it turned out, was not chic or stylish, was definitely short, and made me look like a Bob or a Nick or a Tim. It didn't help matters that I wore baggy t-shirts and jeans most of the time. I didn't have boobs yet or that I never wore jewelry, not even earrings. I wasn't interested. I freely admit that I looked like a boy, but I felt like a girl. I would get really uncomfortable when people would confuse me for a boy. It happened all the time. Busters, store clerks, other kids, other parents. I would be called he and him and that guy constantly. The thing that bothered me most about it was that I hated correcting people. Not because I wanted them to believe I was a boy, but because it felt like by doing so, I was admitting to them that I was being a girl wrong. To say, oh, I'm actually a girl, felt like saying, I'm failing at being a girl, as though gender were a skill and not an identity. And I didn't really care if strangers assumed I was a boy, but if I didn't correct them, they would sometimes later become not strangers and not strangers always eventually figured it out. And if I don't correct someone and they later found out the truth, then they would give me this look that I found unbearable. But despite all of this stress, I kept my hair short for years. Once I was on vacation with my family and we were at a buffet at the Peppermill Hotel in Mesquite, Arizona. And I was in front of an old man in the buffet line. He kept commenting on everything I put on my plate. That's too much salad for a growing boy. You need meat on that plate. And you're gonna need more potato salad than that if you want big muscles, son. He cheered me on when we reached the roast station, and he even made sure that I took two desserts. Felt weird. First, because I wasn't used to people encouraging me to eat. Most people that I talk to do know that I'm a girl, and how we speak to girls is just different than how we speak to boys. Girls are, in so many ways, asked to be smaller, to fit in, to defer, to move over, to make room. Boys are asks, asked to show up, to speak up, to take charge, to fill rooms. But mostly, I was terrified that he might find out the truth about me and that he would be disappointed. We had a rapport going on. He was nice. I was getting his approval and I really liked it. But my siblings were also there and my parents and they would surely correct them if they heard him calling me son. And if he did find out, he would give me that look. That embarrassed expression while he flashes through all of the references he made to an imagined Y chromosome. That puzzled look that wonders, why didn't I correct him the first time? Why didn't I correct him the first time? Why didn't I confess to a complete stranger that I'm a failure who can't get it together enough to style myself like all the other girls? Why didn't, I why didn't I challenge his assumptions about gender expression and the world's 
Why wasn't I brave enough to be whatever kind of girl I wanted to be and not feel any pressure to apologize for it? I managed to make it through the buffet queue without exposing myself. And I joined my family in our booth for our dinner. After our meal, I walked with the rest of my family out of the restaurant. As we passed this gentleman's table, I held my breath. He leaned over and said to my mother, that's one fine boy you got there. I stiffened and braced myself for what felt like an inevitable reveal. He was going to find out. He was going to think I was a liar or a sneak. He would know that I'm not a fine boy, but just an entirely inadequate girl. He was going to be embarrassed. I was going to be humiliated and it was gonna be all my fault. My mother swiveled her head and flashed a smile. Thank you, she sang. I breathed an enormous sigh of relief. I couldn't believe I got away with it. After we were a few steps out of the restaurant, my mother asked, who was that? I have no idea, answered my brother, looking a little creeped out. No idea at all. The end. <laughs> Great story, Alyssa. Thank you for Thank sharing you. with us. Yes. I just want to say that um, I'm proud tonight that women have filled this room up. Just based on the story that you were saying, <laughs> men take space. Well, women have taken space here tonight. So yay. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so I loved it. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, so our last little promo here is I want to tell everyone, please, please, please check out the Rising Star Drama Camps. They're a go this year following COVID safety protocol. They're an amazing educational opportunity for youth here in our community. They're led by some amazing instructors. So please go to edu.gpltrisingstars.com to check out all the programming for that. You will not regret it for sure. Okay, so let's move on to our final storyteller of this evening, Elizabeth Swanson. Oh, hey, Alyssa, I think you should call your story The Changeling. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, but I also was not aware, which is it's not strange being a friend of Judy, that there was a theme. Uh, so I, I do apologize but mine has nothing to do with change it that just has totally to do yeah it just has to do with my life um and a car wash so with my poor peripheral vision and my inability to accurately assess distance going through a, an automated car wash is a challenge to begin with one has to successfully guide the car into the track and I tend to overthink this a bit and in my anxiety oversteer so that one set of the wheels inevitably, inevitably misses the mark and has to be wrenched down to where it was supposed to be. Then there is the moment of fear when the car wash instructs you to let go, take your hands off of the wheel, your foot off of the brake and put the car into neutral. From this point on, you are told to sit back and, and just enjoy the experience. And usually I do, no longer responsible for anything requiring either coordination or thought. One time, however, such complacency was horribly misplaced. On this particular day, I had splurged a bit and selected the super deluxe option. This went beyond the straightforward wet soap rinse and blow dry to include rainbow colored sides, cascading waterfalls and wax. I had just settled down to enjoy the technicolored show when things went wrong. Now well beyond the first soak and perhaps a third of the way down the track, the whole thing ground to a halt. The track stopped its purpose, purposeful movement of my car. The swish, swish of the enormous fluffy brushes stopped. There were no fantasy suds sliding down my windows. I was, it appeared, stuck in the middle of a car wash. I waited patiently for perhaps as much as 30 seconds. Nothing happened, no one came rushing to my aid. I felt abandoned and even worse, trapped by the dreaded track. 
Having been told to keep my hands off, it never occurred to me that I could have engineered my own rescue, that I, I could have moved the car into drive, put my hands on the wheel and driven safely through. I was heading towards a full blown panic attack when I saw it. A bright, shiny red button on the wall above which were the words, call for help. Relieved, I flung open the driver's door and began picking my way over car wash paraphernalia to the button when it happened. The track, still clutching my car, began to move. Jets of water squirted merrily inside through the open door and those multicolored foam clouds descended on both me and it. As I watched my car move yet further away, I had but one thought catch it. Now both soapy and very, very wet, I lurched ahead and grabbed hold of the door as the car happily glided towards its final rinse and wax. I slid in, riding a wave of water now occupying the driver's seat, and slammed the door shut. Defeated, rather than jubilant, I closed my eyes and put my head on the steering wheel as the last of the foam dripped down my forehead. My car and I, together again, exited the car wash. Back in, in control, I became seized with the need to report this incident to the authorities, which in this case was a rather horrified young man behind the gas station counter. As I squelched my way towards him, a ghastly hush fell over those inside, unable as they were to look away from the wreckage of me. Undaunted, I informed the boy that the car wash had experienced a malfunction and that perhaps someone should have a look. Duty done, I turned and made my way out the door and into my car. Time has passed. There have been other car washes and other cars. The lesson learned that day remains, however, when the unexpected occurs, when something goes horribly wrong, take control and get the hell out. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'd say you hit the theme right on. There was a big change. You were dry <laughs> when you went in and you were wet when you came out. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so thank you so much to all of our storytellers tonight it was fantastic it i went through all the emotions sad happy i laughed a lot it was great i also want to give a special thanks to david banks and andrew who are our producers here for our variety nights and uh, thanks to the Grand Prairie Live Theatre Board and volunteers for organizing these nights and making this all possible. So yeah, that's it for our evening. And thank you all for joining us so much. And I hope to see you all again soon.